All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, January 24th meeting of the CNCF IoT Edge um, working group. And as you know, we are a CNCF working group, so we abide by the code of conduct, which um, you can see in our meeting notes, which we can throw into chat. Um, but beyond that, it really just means respect each other. Uh, and this meeting, uh, we are recording it as usual. So if you don't want to be recorded, feel free to turn off your screen or go ahead and change your name or hop off. Um, and with that, we can go ahead and get started with some announcements. Uh, the first one we have is that we have a white paper that was finally um, published, which is really exciting. I think, Tamoya, you actually discovered that it was officially posted. I'm going to go ahead and drop that into chat. Um, but this is a white paper that we've been working on. Andy's been in the lead of that um, and a few others as well. And we finally got it published. And so maybe we can spend some time talking about how we want to spread the word on that? Is there certain avenues that we want to go ahead and talk about it through? Yeah, so I've done some promotion in my own personal circles. Uh, I don't know what else is available to us other than uh, another tag session potentially at, at, in Paris. Does anybody else have any ideas? What's um, what was the route that I guess my question would be was, what was the route that was taken or the steps that were taken after the original, uh, white paper was released a few years ago? I think it's pretty much we had no strategy in the sense of it was a lot of in individual personal channels that were used. Um, okay. So maybe one thing that we could do is if you post it on your socials, just trying to be proactive about elevating each other's posts if we are on each other's LinkedIn. So just reposting, commenting um, is one way to kind of get more traction on it. Um, but I mean, we could potentially also write a CNCF blog um, now that mm -hmm. we have the um, paper. And so mm -hmm. that could be a good option um, that we could try to reach out. I think um, maybe the marketing team would be the best for that. Um, and since Brandon's so close to them, we could try and do that, uh, to have a post that's associated with it, but we already have the paper, so I don't know how redundant that would be. Um, but right. I think the runtime session at KubeCon EU is also a good option. Um, remind me, Andy, are you going to be there? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I'm hedging toward going. My session was not accepted. We do have... I should be at the pavilion, the partner pavilion, uh, and we do have a poster that was accepted. So okay. not the best scenario, but not the worst either. So the potential is I could be there. I'm, uh, I'm I'm checking right now internally. I should know by, you know, end of this week if I'm going or not. Okay, cool. Um, well, then we, I know Dehan's going to be there. So we'll definitely have like, um, someone who could at least present the paper or share the link to the paper and spread it at mm -hmm. that meeting. Okay. Um, but I think, yeah, a good first action is socials and uplifting each other's um, posts. But if someone, anyone has a channel that they found very productive for sharing things through um, that comes to mind now or in the future, we can also share that. The um uh the um, uh ambassador channel seems to be a real accelerant for that. Um, so we can link it in there and ask folks to retweet. That tends to be, uh, just a really reliable group of folks that you know will drop stuff on their LinkedIn and social media and stuff like that. So um, uh, yeah, we can we can put it in there. That'd be great. Um, <clears throat> what is it? Just pound CNCF ambassador. Or? Yeah, I think there is a there's a private channel for current ambassadors. Um, I'm one right now. Uh, so is Taylor on our team, and I'm not sure if anyone else in this group is, but I'm happy to link it in. And um, you know, the group, the, the ambassadors are, you know, I mean, like it's the usual suspects and cloud native. You know, yeah. uh, Kate, you were an ambassador before, weren't you? Or um, no, not an ambassador. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's a project maintainer. 
it's just the it's I feel like it's the same people that always volunteer um, around. Uh, but, um, you know, it it does it does come with, you know, commitments that, you know, you you know check things off the list every month. So, you know, we're and then you have to you know go back in and then do a report if you want to stay as an ambassador. So I think folks are pretty diligent about I think that's one of the reasons they get a good response is, you know, in your monthly reporting, you have to, you know, document and link, you know, hey, here's all the all the publicity stuff I did. So when you put um, things in, if we can give, if we can craft just something the ambassadors can cut and paste, I think it's a good way for us to go, you know, to like take a group of high profile, you know, cloud native people and get them to amplify our message. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'm connecting with you now uh, without a note. Well, all right, just ask me for a note. All right, so I'm connecting on LinkedIn with you now. Um, okay. Yeah, or I'm on all the Slacks. So if you want to hit me on CNCF or uh, Kubernetes Slack, you can, we can just, if you want to just craft the message with, um, you know, the uh, the link, I'll just cut and paste it in. Uh, the ambassador Slack is on CNCF. I'll, I'll paste it in there and we should be, and I'll do an ad here and ask them to repost it. Okay. I'm going over there now to check you out there. And I can add it to the runtime tag channel. Um, and there, since we're within that, and that'll be a second forum, but definitely not as powerful as the ambassador channel. Okay, very good. Yeah, I did. <clears throat> I did one that was more like my personal involvement, but it just uh, just recently finished up collaboration on blah blah blah, and um, advertised that. So that was well received. But then I'll I'll get you something that's a little more generic in nature, and I'll get it over to you. I'm connected to you now in Slack, and I'll do that by the end of today. Thank you for your help, both of you. Um, and Kate, I guess I'll get that to you also separate in separate cover. Yeah. Gotcha. Awesome. Any other announcements people want to share before we go into kind of the meat of the meeting, which was to finally dive into WebAssembly a little bit more? Awesome. Okay. Uh, let's go for it. So, um, we had Rob kicked us off the, in the new year with a really good discussion point in our last meeting, which was what are kind of our goals for 2024 for the working group. And one of the repeated topics was WebAssembly. It has been in the past. And so um, it's clear that the Edge Working Group really wants to know deeply about WebAssembly and then maybe even take that knowledge further and do something with it. Um, so to kick that off, um, I put together kind of a presentation on WebAssembly, what are the resources that exist, the tooling, the terms, and I wanted to see how far we can get. Um, and there's some hands-on at the end that we might get to, and I can share this out. And Liam's, of course, here too. So feel free to pause, ask us questions. Liam, feel free to jump in. Um, there might be someone from Fermion who jumps in later to the meeting to add another. Um, opinion to the, the field too. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And then I'll also share this presentation afterwards as well. Okay, great. Um, can everyone see this? Yes. Cool. I'm going to yeah. keep this um, outside of presentation mode in case we want to go to some of these links that I'm showing. So um, let me know if this isn't uh, large enough, though. How does this first page look to everyone in size? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Um, so this might be a little re redundant for folks. So if this is boring, um, let me know if we should go faster. But I'm going to just go from a baseline. Okay, so what is WebAssembly? And then on the side, I have this word WASM. As a sub point, um, this is an abbreviation, not an acronym. So technically, it shouldn't be all caps, but that's just a a side point that I'm going to throw out there. Um, but WebAssembly, the origination of it was that it was started in the browser, hence that word web. And it was made so that we could have write web applications in languages other than JavaScript. So it was another target that you could target, something that you could target 
in a variety of languages and be able to run your code in the browser. Um, it expanded beyond the browser, and that's part of the reason why we're interested in it today. So specifically, it's a specification, um, and I have a link to it um, elsewhere in the documentation, but of a binary instruction format, um, and the result of it is that it's this portable compilation target. It's an open standard, so it's fully um, run by open bodies. Um, and the benefits of it are that it's polyglot, so that original goal of it for the browser. So any language that can compile to WebAssembly can compile to WebAssembly. So it's it has support for it. And there's um, I have a language matrix later on that shows all the languages that have support for WebAssembly. Um, and it is the majority of the major languages out there. It's small, so these finalized .wasm files are very small and very portable, therefore. So you can move them um, very easily. Um, you could compare this to containers, which are much larger in size, um, and that makes it for great for edge scenarios that we've talked about. And it's very fast to start up. It's not the same as native. It's about two times slower. Um, but it is still very fast and near native and it's isolated. So you're getting the, those near native speeds, um, but it's isolated in linear memory. So the code should not be able to break out of its memory sandbox. So this is kind of a bullet list of some of what WebAssembly gives you. If we look at how we get there, um, so you have your code, um, you're writing it in one of those languages that can compile WebAssembly. And now you have WebAssembly, so you have a, a .wasm file. And the next step is you need a runtime to execute it. So when we talk about WebAssembly, there's two different parts of it. There's the actual WebAssembly bytecode, and then there's the runtime that's isolating it in linear memory and executing it. Um, and that's when you get to the discussion about WebAssembly being a virtual machine itself. So it's isolated and run and has only access to certain um, host level resources and memory resources. So on that point of what are runtimes. So there's browser runtimes. So those ones that were meant to complement and run alongside JavaScript in the browser um, to name a few uh, or, or outside of the browser if we're talking about um, Node.js. And then there's runtimes that support WASI or running WebAssembly on the host and not necessarily WASI even for all of these, um, but um, support running WebAssembly natively um, on outside of the browser. And so to name a few, and some of these are just runtimes and some of these are developer tools that have runtimes inside them. So I called out um, spin and Wasm Cloud there at the end because both of these actually use Wasm time crates um, and, in, and in that way are developer tools and runtimes. I'm going to pause for a second. Are there any questions? Well, lots of questions. I'm not sure if this is a good to okay. uh, at this point. Um, um, go for it. So, um, I know that there is effort to uh, make uh, WASM run in a container, right? You know, OCI container. Um, so that's like to, to take advantage of uh, the container Kubernetes technology, basically. Um, so, so with with container technology, you, you can take advantage of the security uh, orchestration and all that. I know right now uh, it's not. Being uh, Kubernetes is not being used right now to run uh, any WASM runtime. Is, is that correct? I guess, first of all. And if so, uh, how is security and is done? I know orchestration is not using Kubernetes, but how about security? How is it done at this point? So, to start with the question, WebAssembly is currently today running on Kubernetes. Um, that is happening. Um, and the runtime that is you executing WebAssembly on Kubernetes is a variety of them. There's a lot of them. Wasm Edge is a runtime that runs um, WebAssembly on Kubernetes. So is Spin, so is Wasm Cloud. Um, the, all three of those runtimes run WebAssembly on Kubernetes. Um, and all three of them are using something called a container D shim. So it's this shim on top of container D that essentially when 
container D goes to run your application, it's actually calling to that runtime to execute that WebAssembly module um, or component. And uh, in that way, you get the orchestration benefits of Kubernetes. So you're still just deploying your pod, but you set a runtime class. And that runtime class informs container D to run your WebAssembly application using its shim. So um, that's actually the demo that I put for next time, literally um, next time, Wasm on Kubernetes. So I think we should hold off on the orchestration of WebAssembly and focus more on what WebAssembly is for today, or that's at least what I had planned. So I don't have a specific walkthrough demo that I wanted to show today of Kubernetes, but you can. And then on the question of OCI, so OCI is a specification. Um, the actual artifact type uh, can be a variety of different artifacts. It doesn't actually have to be container. So the C of OCI being open container is a little confusing given that it doesn't actually need to be a container that is described in an OCI artifact. So you can have an OCI artifact that is purely just a .wasm file and that can execute on Kubernetes. You can also choose to put WebAssembly inside a container and get the benefits of C groups and kind of have an extra la la layer of security on top of WebAssembly if you want. Um, and that would be your choice of putting your WebAssembly module inside of a container. Okay, so so basically if it's on the server, it's using the Docker shim to run uh, in, in the Kubernetes environment. If it's browser and it does not, right, that's, how, how does, I guess maybe out of scope, but uh, where you touch about, like if it's in browser, um, what kind of security uh, orchestration, how, how is that done? So um, if it's on the server, uh, you're using a runtime. That doesn't necessarily mean that is Docker. Um, if it's on Kubernetes, you're using a container D shim. If it's in the browser, um, you'll use one of the runtimes that I, I mentioned here um use one of those runtimes um i'm about to get to the whole security question because my answer to security is what runtime are you using so your runtime is in charge of isolating and executing your WebAssembly module and therefore it is in charge of ensuring that your code does not escape its sandbox so when you talk about security the like first layer of that is your runtime choice does that make sense yeah okay uh, thanks cool um, so let's get into that. Actually, that was a really good cue in, um, Victor. And by the end of this, depending on time, we'll execute a module using a runtime, and that might solidify what it looks like a little. Um, so what are runtimes responsible for? So I have this .wasm bytecode that my uh, language of choice has spit out. Now I want to run it. Um, and so the runtime's responsible for compiling that bytecode to machine code. Um, or some runtimes are interpreters, um, namely Whammer or the WebAssembly micro runtime, which is great for um, smaller devices that can't host multiple binaries. Um, so it's in charge of compilation. It's in charge of performance. So certain runtimes allow for more optimizations before executing it so that you can kind of have it in this um, prepared state so that once it executes, it's even faster. Um, Runtimes are in charge of security. So when you're choosing a runtime, uh, you want to think about what are the security practices it takes into place? Like what is language is it implemented in? If that's a part of security that's important to you, does it do fuzzing? What kind of supply chain security does it have? What kind of reporting does it have? What does its mitigation loop look like? So all those things that talk about the health of the code base itself, and then also its implementation itself are the things you want to think about within the security of it. And then once again, the runtime is in charge of putting that WebAssembly um, instance inside of linear memory and executing it there. So it's in charge of making sure it cannot execute that uh, or cannot escape that. So that's the main part of its duty. And all of those health of the code bases ensures that it upholds that responsibility. Um, and part of this also is that your runtime gives level to, gives access to resources to your WebAssembly module. So it's giving access to host level resources. And in doing that, it needs to do that in a safe way. Um, a runtime is also responsible for platform agnosticity. So we say you can run WebAssembly anywhere. Well, you can only run it where its runtime can run. So you're limited to where your WebAssembly can run by where your runtime can run. 
and um, runtimes are responsible for supporting WASI. So when you hear WebAssembly Systems Interface or WASI, it is up to a runtime to decide whether or not to support that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about WASI, what WASI is, but it's essentially a set of interfaces that allow your WebAssembly module to access host level resources, um, such as files, et cetera. And a runtime can also do more than these. It could additionally be a developer tool um, and have different extra tooling in it to simplify the process of creating WebAssembly modules and components. Um, so it can do even more. It doesn't need to be just limited to the baseline of what a runtime's responsible for. So I went ahead and went through um, some of the runtimes that I'm more familiar with or some of the bigger name ones and tried to go through some of these for them. This is not complete and I only could spend so much time putting this together. Um, and on this also I'll call out uh, Liam if you see something that's missing. Um, and then some of these, I was thinking we were talking about as a working group, what can we do with this knowledge? And one of the things is work together on, fill this, on filling this out even more. Um, so I started with the ones that I was more familiar with. So WASM time. And, and just to take a step back, um, I kind of jumped in because I assumed most of y'all were familiar with where I work and what I do. But I work at Fermion, which is focused on running, creating, building and running serverless WebAssembly applications. And our open source runtime is called SPIN. Um, and so that is my foremost lens of knowledge and perspective. And so keep that in mind as I'm giving this information. Um, and SPIN uses under, hood, under the hood WASM time, which is why I'm more familiar with it of any of the runtimes. So with WASM time, um, when we talk about compilation, you can do ahead of time or just in time. And it uses specifically the crane lift compiler, it doesn't have an interpreter mode. Um, and security, it has a really comprehensive article on how it um, satisfies basically making sure its code's well-maintained, well-written, well-tested, well-verified. Um, and it has a project called Very Wasm that ensures that WebAssembly, that like components built from it cannot escape the sandbox. Um, and so it has like a very extensive article that it's published about its security practices, if you want to know the details of that. Um, performance, um, it provides a lot of um, basically libraries to do more and more. So it provides ways to pre-compile, pre-instantiate, and do a bunch of things to speed up the execution when you're finally ready to run your component. And um, platforms, it supports the major um, operating systems and architectures, but for this group I want to call out, it does not support 32-bit architectures. So that is a limit for constrained devices. Um, and from talking a little bit to some of the folks um, involved with WASI, it would not be trivial to implement that. That would be like a probably a six month initiative um, was like one of the estimates I got. Um, and, but something that would be on a roadmap right now, um, Wasm Time has been really focused on hitting the preview two target um, and solidifying that. That could be something that down the line becomes more of a priority, especially if there is like pressure from groups to see it in the IoT constrained device space. Um, and then when we talk about WASI, um, Watson Time fully supports Preview 2 in main and, um, well, sorry, this is actually just not accurate. Um, old, um, but it fully supports Preview 2 um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. And then when we, the organization that is in charge of Watson Time is called the Bytecode Alliance. Um, which is a governing body for a lot of the WebAssembly initiatives and projects that you'll see out there. Okay, and so when I mentioned performance, um, here's an example. I took this from a slide from a talk that Joel and I gave in like uh, WASM Day like a year ago. But just to give an example of some of the kind of knobs you can turn with WASM time that a lot of other runtimes may provide, but I'm not as familiar with. You can see here that you can bring down the execution time through kind of adjusting various things and various ways you use your runtime. Um, and so this brought down 
um, the execution time of this WebAssembly component from six um, microseconds to seven nanoseconds, um, just by kind of do, using the tool very precisely. Um, so just to kind of show like, it is about how, not only what runtime you use, but how you use it to get those performance benefits. Um, great, another runtime is JCO. Um, uh, J, the J in it stands for JavaScript. So it is focused on the JavaScript language. So it's focused on being able to compile JavaScript into components that can, and then it can make it so that you can run those components like on the server or in the browser. Um, and security, I'm not familiar with um, the security practices of JCO. I didn't spend a lot of time researching it. Um, there might be an article out there or something like that. So I would um, love if someone had any context on that and could throw that in. Um, Wasn't time just had that one post that was very comprehensive to see. Um, performance, it provides flags to optimize with Binarian um, and also fully support it, uh, fully supports Wazi Preview too. And this Jayco has a level of developer tooling on top of just kind of the runtime parts of it. Uh, it also makes it so that you can basically take a WebAssembly component and then transpile it to JavaScript and then take a take JavaScript and componentize it to WebAssembly. So it's not only a runtime, but it also helps you build WebAssembly. So it does even the steps before that. And it also has um, some subcommands from the Wasm Tools project, which is also within the Bytecode Alliance. Jayco is also within the Bytecode Alliance um, that enables examining components. And um, I'll show you, we'll use Wasm Tools a little later too, if we get time. Um, I'm gonna rapid fire through some other ones. Whammer, because I realize I'm spending a lot of time on this. So if this is not, what people are interested in hearing more about, we can skip ahead to hands-on too. Um, but I do want to point out Whammer because this is the one that this group has discussed or people have called out um, reasonably so because it's called Whammer for the WebAssembly micro runtime. And um, it is focused on being able to run WebAssembly on as many devices as possible is one way to think about it. So it has a lot of different ways of compiling and running. So you can do it ahead of time, just in time. It has interpreters. And it also um, has two different ways of um, two different types of compilers. So they, I don't know a lot about, I haven't used Whammer before, um, but when we're talking about performance, they have a lot of benchmarks. So I would check those out. Um, platforms, like I was saying, very extensive. So 32 and 64 bit and on most operating systems, they have a whole set of documentation on that. Um, and this is just a look at some of them. Oh, I um, couldn't find things specific to security for um, Whammer either. Would love if people could fill that in. Um, and they fully support Wazi Preview 1, um, and they're working on supporting um, the Kapoda model or Preview 2. Anything you would add, Liam, on Whammer? I mean, I think the key, I think you nailed it. This is a great um a presentation i i have taken some notes here that i'll send to you um just some suggestions afterwards but the um you know whammer is really for it's really got the mind share below linux um and i, I noticed that um there's somebody on from sony i i know that um sony is um some of the divisions in sony sony Medicura is um uh, talks frequently about their adoption of whammer siemens bosch both talk about their adoption and use of whammer uh, publicly a lot. And um, Intel is one of the driving forces behind Whammer, which is also in the Bytecode Alliance. So the two, I think, most important uh, runtimes and Jayco is as well. So I guess the, which is, uh, goes final, went final, I think yesterday um, uh, on its, was just released yesterday for its uh, MVP or 1.0 or something like that. Um, are there, but Whammer is, you know, below Linux is where it's in the embedded space is where it is really dominant. And I think we're collectively uh, seeing Wasm time is the dominant player on Linux um, uh, with Fastly, you know, Fermion, Cosmonic, and a lot of the players there. 
that's not to say that um, the other runtimes don't have a spot because there are a lot of runtimes. I mean, even within CNCF, you have, um, uh, you know, there's a Wasm Edge, which is a separate uh, runtime, uh, and then Wasm Cloud, which is a uh, a runtime that uses Wasm time uh, on the inside. So. Um, I think there's a lot of great options depending on where in the matrices you're really looking to fit here. Yeah, that was a great Q in. Um, so Wasm Edge, I didn't have, I haven't used before. I didn't have time to fill in, but um, it is like Liam mentioned a CNCF project. Um, and if anyone wants to dive into it and fill this out, that would be great. Um, Wasm Cloud, also a CNCF project. Um, that is built on top of Wasm Time. So if you're trying to profile it for performance and platforms and security, uh, you would expect it would be similar to Wasm Time. Um, and uh, developer it has a level of developer tooling on top of being a runtime. So uh, when we we start to discuss, there are some runtimes that also are tooling. So trying to simplify this whole WebAssembly experience, which is quite um, intimidating. So making it so that you can scaffold application, build apps, run them, use data and host level resources, and also run it in a global cloud. Um, and it kind of simplifies that with the WASH CLI. Um, and I just spoke for Liam's project. So um, feel mm -hmm. free to correct that. Uh, yeah. One, you did an awesome job. To the community is far bigger than Liam. You know, it's you know, <laughs> the member of the this massive project that is like almost 500 contributors at this point. Uh, I definitely was a co-founder of the project, but it is definitely our project in the CNCF. So totally fine. And three, you did a great job. So you cool. can you can intro a awesome thought at any time. <laughs> <laughs> great. Not. Um and very similar is Spin, which is what I work on, um, which is not a CNCF project, but it is fully open source. Um, and it's very similar in the rundown here in that it simplifies the experience of scaffolding, building, and running locally or in the cloud um, and using data and host rate level resources using the Spin CLI. Um, so both of those kind of, if you want to get a quick start experience to using WebAssembly and running it locally and in the cloud, those are great projects to get started with. Okay. Um, taking, now that we've talked about what runtimes are, let's take a step back into some terminology. Um, and this slides from a presentation. Um, Bailey Hayes and I gave at Wasm Day this past Wasm at uh, past Wasm Day, and when you hear WebAssembly, as I have been repeating over and over, um, you may hear, hear both the term module and component, which I have been using interchangeably. Um, so let's start with what is a core module for WebAssembly. So a few years ago, all there were were WebAssembly core modules. Um, and this is the, the promise of WebAssembly that we started with. It's being able to take all these different languages and compile them to a core module. Um, and what do you get out of a WebAssembly module? You get all those characteristics that we kind of started up off with, like it's open source, it's fast, it's isolated, um, it's portable. Um, so it's pretty great. You would think maybe that's enough, honestly. Um, and here's that specification I said was linked somewhere. Um, but there's actually so much more we could do with WebAssembly if we added a layer on top of that. And that is the component model. So the component model is basically a, a component is a wrapper we put around a WebAssembly core module that basically helps define it. So it's like putting a blueprint on top of someone or like something that defines what the WebAssembly module can do. So it specifies the imports and the exports of that module. So what does it need in order to execute imports and what does it provide to other components that it exports and this is where you get that word component from because it makes it composable with other components so you can see in this picture here we have two WebAssembly core modules each one wrapped in a component and that component is saying that the one on component a exports we'll say this is interface foo and component b imports it and so now I can use component tooling, such as Wasm tools, to compose them into one component. <laughs> and the thing to note here 
And so now I can build a WebAssembly module in Rust and a different one in Go, and they can import and export libraries with each other and be composed together into one WebAssembly component. So you still get one .wasm file at the end, even though you've actually pieced together multiple different languages. And um, each of them are isolated in their own linear memory still. So components are isolated from each other and they're finalized in a final component. So now we get some new adjectives we can throw on WebAssembly if we're using the component model. We can say it's composable, it's language interoperable, and you have this fine-grained sandboxing of libraries being isolated from each other. And so this is why when people are talking about WebAssembly and you start hearing the component model and they're getting excited about it, this is kind of the picture of why people are excited about it, um, is it kind of takes the developer experience of WebAssembly to the next level. I'm going to pause here. Are there any questions on this image so far? I have a question about the, so when you talk about components, is this equivalent to building a, a Kubernetes container image? In other words, is this dynamic or is it just, uh, do, do you know, when you, when you do the um, building the component import and all that, is there any security authentication authorization needed for the component then building? So components are composed with each other by they must have a specific interface. Um, so component A ex will only import it's the interface it expects component B to expose. Um, that being said, signed components. So right now, all it's doing when you do a compose is checking that that component ha looks as it should look. It is only importing the specific function that it wants, and it's doing nothing more than that. Um, but signed components, I believe, do not exist yet, but is something that's been discussed. Liam, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, and there's a theme here that is connected um, across um, the conversation. Earlier, you'd asked um, about, you know, like uh, security. Um, you know, what's the real big difference here between what's happening uh, between containers at a high level and um, WebAssembly is, you know, containers are scoped to POSIX, right? And uh, when we're thinking about um, WebAssembly components, um, the ABI, the application boundary interface here is dynamic. So a WebAssembly component says, here's all of the, um, the API functions that I both import and I export. So I might take in, you know, WASI clocks, I might take in, you know, networking, I might take in um, CLI, um, uh, and the uh, boundary for this module from a security perspective is limited to that. If you have a module that just takes in or just imports HTTP and then just exports, um, you know, HTTP or takes in a file and exports HTTP, it is locked in. And those are the only functions that it has uh, permissions for. So with um, components here, and Kate, I apologize if I'm skipping ahead, no, uh, you're sort of limited to these this importing and exporting. Signing is um, is not uh, quite a thing yet, um, but there we're, we've all already agreed behind the scenes on what we're going to use. We're going to um, we're going to use um, a similar thing to what's happening in the container world. Um, it's uh, Fermion's already using it, and Wasm Cloud's working on um, support for it um, right now. Uh, and the other folks in the Bytecode Alliance are um, going to do it as well. So we'll have the ability to sign these components um, in the near future as well and make them very compatible. Kate, did I, do you think I did a good job answering that question? I just tried to yeah, connect no, the story arc there. In the short term, I can um, just think of it as just the traditional compile and linking to be able to execute away at this point. In the future, there might be signed component there'll be more security options at that time, right? Yeah, think think of this as, um, whereas containers are an abstraction at the operating system level, um, uh, WebAssembly components are an abstraction at the, um, at the uh, library level, is the easy way to think about it mentally. So it's just that next step up in, in abstraction layers. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, I got a question too. So these components are meant to be like libraries 
or like application framework? So they do not have to be anything in particular. Um, yeah. One story that we talked about was a library because people get excited about, for example, having one URL library across all languages instead of every language having to implement their own URL library. That's one story that people have told, but it could yeah. also be um, an application in a way. Like say you have um, an application that does HTTP authentication, that's HTTP authentication middleware. So it wants to do like an OAuth loop before it lets your request continue. That is an application in a sense. Um, and that could be composed with your business logic. Um, and so you only have to build that middleware once in one language and you can compose it with any business logic. I see, that makes sense. Yeah, so that can't um, be anything, but yeah. Yeah, so it can be it, anything. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. It's pluggable. So um, think about, um, um, who, are you familiar with OpenAPI? Um, as a specification for defining APIs. Okay. You know, like um, like strings, um, integers, um, what's, you know, similar yeah. to what's on screen here. The component model is a little bit bigger than open API from a scoping perspective. And let me explain why. Um, when you're defining components, um, uh, you're defining what we call worlds. And the WASI point two ships with a few common worlds that are somewhat analogous to the features that you find in POSIX, networking, file systems, um, clocks. Um, you were working on some crypto stuff. Um, a we There is some crypto libraries that are floating around that are not standardized, but it's extendable in that you can use um, an IDL, an interface definition language called WIT, where you can define your own um, imports and exports. Now that's great because let's say you're a video game company and you want to create imports for high level abstractions like world, uh, like um, players or weapons or characters, or you are working on a Raspberry Pi like this. Um, we actually um, have one um, like a world's defined for software defined radios or for the GPIO block or sensors or things like that. Um, and as you then compose those worlds, you get those same security benefits. When I create an application that uses those standard worlds or my custom worlds, I've now composed a new sort of minimal security boundary. And that's why this IDL wit is bigger than what you would use with something like OpenAPI, because you're not only importing um, the idea of, you know, integers and um, strings that need to be lifted and lowered between languages, but you're also um, importing uh, like resources. Um, so you can define things like um, uh, that are context sensitive in a, in a protocol way. So like with HTTP, um, the definition for that a block includes like the body as a resource and the headers as a resource. And you can imagine why. You might want to edit the headers, you know, for a proxy but you might want to refer to the body as a separate resource. So it's um, a bit more comprehensive and gives you more tools to build a uh, better components that are there. So okay, maybe because yeah. we're curious about this, maybe we should just go ahead and jump into kind of what this looks like um, because we've been abstract and we can save the rest of the content for after we've looked at it briefly. Um, if that would be helpful um, to kind of see what this is all looks like. Um, so let me think about if, what we want to do first. Um, maybe we do, let's, let's um, build a component from scratch. How does that sound? Um, and run it using Wasm time. And we can look at what the components with interface that it exposes looks like and go from there, if that seems helpful. Sounds good to me, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so what we're gonna do is build basically a simple hello world. Um, so here I'm using cargo component. Actually, before we jump into the tool, let me just go to the tool. Um, so this is Cargo Component um, within the Bytecode Alliance. It's basically tooling to help you build um, components out of Rust. 
So you can um, natively build WebAssembly from Rust uh, using the WASM32 WASI target, um, but this takes it a level further so that you can build components immediately from Rust. Um, so the experience looks similar to um, to what you're familiar with with cargo in the sense of instead of cargo new, you do cargo component new. Um, I gave it the name command, which I might be overloading the term command here. Um, and I'm using a command flag. So with the, the cargo component tooling, you can specify that you want to build a command component or a reactor component. Basically, you're saying, does this component export the WASI CLI world? Um, can it be executed on command line and run? Or does it need to be composed with something else that can be executed? So if I do this, um, great. Um, let's go ahead and look at it. I think actually I have it pulled up. Yeah, OK. Um, Great. So basically, we now have just a hello world, and that's it. This isn't super descriptive, but basically, this is going to print hello world. If we look at our cargo um, dot tomo, we're basically saying that we're going to generate bindings for it, and it's um, no nothing more specific about the wit interface because it's just a command component. So cargo component knows that. It is the command CLI or the run, specifically the run function that it exports. Um, we can do a more specific example after this that'll make this a little bit more clear. But now we're going to do a cargo component build release. Um, so we're building our component. OK, so now we have a component. Um, command.wasm. Let's go ahead and look at it with wasm tools. So wasm tools that CLI. Um, that helps inspect components. Um, so let's print the wit for this. Or actually. Um, oops, sorry. OK, so you can see that we've just made a component that exports WASI CLI run. That is the in interface that the runtime will call when it's executed. So wasm time, for example, when you do a wasm time run, it calls wasi CLI run when it's exported. It also optionally imports all these different interfaces from the host. Um, it doesn't use any of that in our um, function. You could see that we weren't importing any of that. It was just a simple hello world. Um, and you could remove all of these imports if you wanted using something called WASI vert to kind of get rid of any of that importing of things you're not using. Um, but just for the simple tooling, we can see that it provides the ability to import all of that. Um, let's look at the WebAssembly text for it. So oops, sorry. Um, just so I can show you kind of what this looks like. So you can see that um, this, when we look at the text human readable, I guess, version of this, you can see that we have this component specification of it. And if we were actually to print more, you would see core module further down. It's going to look gross if we really wanted to do that. Um, I'm not sure we did. Um, but let's see if we... Actually, so you can see within it, um, there's a core module um, and core modules within that. So you can see that the component is wrapping that core module. Just to kind of give a look at it, obviously, this isn't necessary. But um, and now we can run it. Um, let's see. Oops. So we can run it with wasm time, uh, one of the run times that we discussed. And basically, when we're running it, we're going to specify that it is a component. 
um, by specifying that WASM flag. And then you just pass the name, pass the component. And now we have printed hello world. So the only reason we were able to execute WASM time run was because that WASM CLI run function was exported. So that's kind of looking at how there was nothing else the host could have called in that the function that the component made available except for that um, run command. If we want to look at a bigger example, um, I want to show you a good resource for that. Um, there's the component docs within the Bytecode Alliance, which has a tutorial um, that basically shows how you can build a calculator application. And you could imagine that what if each component was a different function? So like add, subtract, delete, it only walks through the add portion of it, but you'll see that one component only exports the add function. So I can briefly show you a finished solution of that. Um, that might make that a little easier to see. Um, so I've, if we go into adder and do a cargo component build release, um, you'll see we built our component. And then here we could do a awesome tools component wit on that and you'll see this only exports an add function um so that's kind of to give a more granular example of how you can define these interfaces for what your component can export and then we can actually compose that with other components that import that so um say we have a calculator component that actually if we look at it it imports the add function so it needs a, a component that has that function. So if we then were to build the calculator, um, and print that, you'll see that it imports add and exports calculate. So that means I should be able to compose this calculator component with this add component across that import boundary. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so we can use Wasm Tools Compose for that. So Wasm Tools Compose, and I'm gonna specify my calculator component. And I'm gonna specify its dependent component, which is the adder component. And I'm going to output some composed module. And now we've composed a component. And let's look at it. you can see that it no longer has an import because we've satisfied it by importing an adder function. And if we go one step further uh, and we have a command component that exports that run command and we build that, which I've already done, we can then compose it all together into a final component. And now we have this final composed component, which we can then let's go ahead and look at at it. Which only exports run. And now we can run it. Uh, oops, sorry. That's the same. And now we can run it. And we saw that adding one plus two is three. I know that was kind of a whirlwind, but I hope that kind of, and my terminal might have even been too small, but I hope that. Um, it shows how you could see each of those components had its interface that it defined, and we resolved those interfaces together to make a finalized component, that final dot wasm that we could execute. And each one of those was fine-grained sandboxed. You could easily see what its capabilities were, and you were able to execute it. 
And um, that whole demo is available here. Um, and I linked that in the slides, but I can go ahead and share that if you want to get hands on with that as well. Do folks have questions on that demo? I know it was very um, kind of sudden. Yeah, Rob. That was an awesome demo. I was wondering, um, you talked before about how the compilation might be um, done ahead of time and then you may just do interpreting on the uh, the actual constrained device. But what about the component composition? Like, would you um, compose a single module and then deploy it to the device? Or would some devices choose to do the composing um, at runtime? Yeah, I think that's a great question, especially for this group. Like we've talked about, say you wanted to do like an over the air update of just that add component. So you have this IoT calculating device and you only want to update the add function. So you want the device to be able to compose it all together and execute it. Um, so composing at runtime, I believe is something that people are working on. Um, so have more defined tooling of like satisfying a component, basically having tooling to basically say this component, like these components all together, I want composed and these are each of their interfaces and that'll be satisfied. Having a tool that does all of that is underway right now, um, but doesn't quite exist yet. So you would kind of have to build up something that could do that for you on your device. Um, otherwise, the norm right now is to compose ahead of time. I don't know if that answers your question. Liam, go for it. I would I would also add that um, you know um, uh, WebAssembly component doesn't um, specify um, what satisfies its imports. So an import can be satisfied by another component, or it could be satisfied by a host. So I think a common strategy that you are seeing in um, a runtime development, so for example, in Spin and in Wasm Cloud is the selective inclusion of specific common um, uh, capabilities. And I think you'll see that um, uh, as um, runtimes continue to build, build out. There are efforts to continue to standard, you know, to build out, you know, really common um, world of components um, as well um, that are out there. Uh, so, um, and where, you know, you know, we are, we're working with uh, like a huge diverse group of people um, to build these things out. Um, I don't, I originally, we weren't sure how, how people would be doing a lot of like runtime composition. What we're seeing uh, people prefer um, is to uh, almost uh, create, you know, um, you know, single, you know, monoliths almost uh, that are pulled together for their purpose. So in like, uh, like in Argo or in CI, um, you know, you, we might assemble those things together um, and then have them have them staged and ready. Um, I think the advantage is uh, in the modularity, though, in that these things are no longer tightly coupled, uh, so that um, uh, we're not chaining development teams to specific libraries at compile time. They can be fixed essentially at runtime by platforms. That's that's the big separation here um, to me that all this stuff that before would get statically baked into a container is now fixable by platforms. That's that's the big deal to me. Very cool. Thank you for the answers. Awesome job, Kate. So, so the 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 the, um, the demo that uh, was just done, um, Kate, is there a, like a demo environment? Because for Kubernetes containers, there are a lot of the uh, like a free lab environment you can test? Is there an environment you can try hands on for WebAssembly? Um, you can just run it on your host. That was it. I was just running that on Linux. You just have to download Wasm Time um, and that's it. So that's, I guess, why we we're uh, getting at your Kubernetes questions is that you don't need anything more than that. Like you really just need a runtime and a WebAssembly component and that's all you need. Can, can I run it on like a Windows as well? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, if we go back to the Wasm time, uh, um, these are its platforms that it supports. 
Bye, Liam. Thanks for coming by. Um, we got probably like a third of the way through the things that I prepared. Um, so, and I know some people had to drop off. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, Victor, you could literally go to these docs and run these now. I did find an issue with them as I was doing it, uh, prepping this morning and I wrote those docs. So that's on me. Um, so I'll fix that, um, push up the fix. Um, thanks, Dayan. Um, but yeah, for those folks who were able to stay a few minutes over, was this helpful? I would love some feedback on if we want to do this again next time and keep going, or you feel like you got enough. Um, what do you think? I personally found this very useful just to help with a lot of the nomenclature. I think one thing that would be useful is um, some sort of hands-on component because I tend to learn kinetically. Um, so this helps get me bootstrapped, but I think it would dig in, sink in more if I had something to go off and whittle away on. Yeah. Um, and then I guess my follow-up question to that is, are you all interested in the component model or not? Because if you're interested in the component model, which is what I was focused on more at the end there, that's a different set of tooling than if you just want to run WebAssembly. Um, so without that component benefit. Um, and the reason I kind of ask is that Whammer does not support the component model. So if we're focused on Whammer, we don't need to know all this component model tooling, but if you're focused on the benefits of the component model, which are those like composability, universal libraries, supply chain security, stuff like that, then we should keep going down this path. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I'm, I'm just interested to learn both uh, with or without component model. I know Whammer for uh, Edge may not be, but uh, yeah, uh, so uh, it, it will be um, great to have a, like, because for Kubernetes, you usually can, you can have a, like, online uh, free demo environment. You can just try it out right there uh, without having to set up, a, uh, because when the when lab get complicated, uh, it, it times it takes to set up a lab to, you know, take a long time. So uh, I know it's a, <laughs> I don't think it's a reasonable ask if it's, it's cool for, uh, you know, any WASM, you know, provider uh, experts to provide that environment, I think it'll be uh, more helpful. I'm gonna push back on that. I really don't think we need a lab. Um, the setup's literally gonna be curling a WASM time and that's it. Um, curling WASM time, curling WASM tools. And um, depending on what language we wanna use, uh, making sure you have the tooling for that. So. I don't think you need a lab for that. Yeah, I guess I guess depend on the purpose. I, I'm I'm actually not a developer, so uh, for me, I, I really like to understand um, a lot of the concept and especially security related. Um, so um, I use a, a environment called Code Cloud, uh, which is go into a lot of a uh, hands on for learning for everything. Uh, that's why it's much faster for me to understand any of the concepts without spending any time pretty much setting up. Mm. Okay. I probably won't have the time to set up an environment that's shareable like that. Um, if other folks want to take that on and set up kind of a code spaces equivalent, um, that would be great. We For Spin, we have demos that use code spaces, not code cloud or what you mentioned, but we could use GitHub code spaces for that. Um, but that's not going to give us the low level learnings that we may want. Um, but I think for you, Victor, you might really be interested in just kind of getting to Kubernetes. Um, are other folks interested in that? Next time, do you want to jump just straight to Kubernetes? I think that would be useful to see that connection and it would um, sort of bridge to some of the topics that we had before. Um, as far as your earlier question about components or no components, um, I think it might be useful to show the, like an example where um, you act, you really need components just to manage <laughs> a large service or application. 
Um, I assume, um, do you normally work with components yourself using your runtime? Um, I'm not my app because I'm building the runtime. I'm not building the application scenarios, if that makes sense. Like I'm the cloud, not the user. Um, so I don't have real world applications that I own that need components. Um, but I do have plenty of applications I've built that are built from, that are WebAssembly applications. Like, uh, like these are all of my WebAssembly components. Like, um, we could go to this application, which is a to-do list, um, like use Kubernetes. Um, and this is built completely off WebAssembly and it uses a SQL database and from the host and all of that. So like there are plenty of applications that I've built that are all WebAssembly, um, mainly all these. Um, yeah. But real world applications that people are running with WebAssembly, I don't have that I've built and that we can look under the hood of. Um, but there is, this is the, I think the best real world example that I've worked on which is building that HTTP auth middleware um, to build an OAuth application with WebAssembly. So that's one we could walk through. Um, I'll add this to the resources section. Um, Does that answer your question? I kind of rambled on it. Um, yeah, no, it, I think that sounds good. So, I mean, I, I would certainly encourage you to talk more about the components because I would imagine that when you start to put together applications that you're running on Kubernetes, having the ability to pull together components would, would uh, make it easier to manage those services. Yeah, um, and just a reminder that a component is still one .wasm file, um, so you would be doing all that work before you put it on Kubernetes. Just a reminder on that. Um, that is a part of your build tooling and CI/CD before you like push your OCI artifact and apply your pod to the cluster. So just a reminder on that. But we'll see that. That makes sense. Um, and then the presentation I gave with Bailey that I don't have here, um, we went through why components. Um, so we can go through that as well. It sounds like we were, we're just interested in learning. So let's go to Kubernetes next time um, and see what does it look like to orchestrate WASM. And then we can go from there to seeing if we want to go deeper into the component model um, and how we want to take things. Sounds good. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks again for doing all this, Kate. This yeah, thank you very much. This has yeah. been great. Thank you, Kate. Awesome. Well, I'm I was great to get the opportunity to kind of put this all together. So um I'll link the deck here in, in the meeting notes and um put draft at the top of it because it's very much we'll we'll build it out together. Awesome. Well, I'll see you all next time then. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.